these fallacies are based on the fact that there's something unclear about the language. Uh, so the first of these is called equivocation. This happens when the arguer uses a word in two different senses in the argument. Sometimes the, the, the word is used in different senses in different premises. Sometimes it's used uh, in a different sense in the premise or the premises and the conclusion. And in other cases, uh, the, the, ar the word has numerous meanings, but the arguer is assuming one meaning, and the hearer is assuming a different meaning, right? And so, and so there's confusion about the meaning of the words as used in the argument. Uh, so here's an example of an argument that commits this fallacy of equivocation. Um, Stevie Wonder is blind. Love is blind. God is love, therefore Stevie Wonder is God. Okay, so I have just proven to you that Stevie Wonder is God. But as you can tell, there's got to be something wrong with the argument. Um, I don't know, maybe some people do believe Stevie Wonder is God, but they shouldn't do so on the basis of this argument because it is fallacious, and it's based on the fallacy of equivocation. Stevie Wonder is blind, Love is blind, God is love, therefore Stevie Wonder is God. Well, there's all kinds of equivocation in this argument. First of all, the word blind means something different when you say Stevie Wonder is blind and you say love is blind. Um, secondly, when we say love is blind and we say God is love, the word love means something different in those two cases. Likewise, when we say love is blind, the word is is, uh, is uh, uh, um, describing the characteristic that love has. When we say God is love, we're identifying God with love. And so there's equivocation on the word is, equivocation on the word blind, and equivocation um, on the word love. And that's why we are able to get to this crazy conclusion that Stevie Wonder is God. Now, how do you recognize that equivocation is going on? Remove the ambiguity, rewrite the argument, and see if it makes any sense. And so if we do this with the Stevie Wonder argument, we remove the ambiguity, you see that the conclusion does not follow at all. Right? Let's remove the ambiguity. First premise, Stevie Wonder cannot see. Second premise, those who love others tend to ignore their faults. Third premise, God is characterized above all with his overwhelming concern for others. Conclusion, Stevie Wonder is God. All right, well, that's a, obviously a terrible argument. It might have looked, at least at first glance, like, wow, I just got an argument that Stevie Wonder is God. But once you remove the ambiguity, once you, you uh, take those words that meant different things in different premises and use equivalent terms for them, then you realize the argument's terrible. All right, so that, that's an example of equivocation. Um, another one that uh, you might use as a logic student is, um, man, uh, Stephen gave me a really strong argument against the death penalty yesterday. I guess I, guess, uh, I should believe that the death penalty is wrong. Right? Um, and so why could this be uh, a fallacy of equivocation? This could be a fallacy of equivocation because uh, the word strong, in the sense that's used in critical thinking and in logic, just means an inductive argument that has a good inferential claim. right? But in common everyday use, when you hear the word strong, you think the argument is good. In other words, we use the word strong in everyday use to mean what the logician means by cogent. Right, so, if, so if someone gave somebody a strong argument against the death penalty, and they conclude from that that, that, that uh, you or someone else should not accept the death penalty, uh, that argument is based on equivocation. Because you can have all kinds of strong arguments for the death penalty or against the death penalty that are terrible arguments. Right? They're strong, the main inference is good, but the premises are all false. All right, so... So that's an example of an argument based on equivocation uh, that comes from critical thinking. Uh, another example, this happened all the time also in elementary school, 
uh, I might say, man, I love this ice cream. And someone says, why don't you marry it then? Right? Well, the assumption, when I say I love the ice cream, I mean it's really delicious and I'm enjoying it. Um, I'm not saying that I want to have a lifelong partnership with it. Right? But the word love is ambiguous. It can mean you're getting a lot of pleasure from the thing, or it can mean that this is a person who is a soulmate that you want to spend the rest of your life with. Clearly, I meant the first. The very humorous arguer uh, uses the second. And that's why uh, it's a joke. If he were serious, right, uh, then we would say he's, he, he was committing the fallacy of equivocation. If he really thought I should marry the ice cream, that is a logical error that's based on uh, two different meanings of the word love. All right, so that's equivocation. Um, a word is used in two or more different senses in different premises or between the premises and the conclusion, or a word has multiple uh, senses and the arguer is using uh, one and the hearer is, is expecting another. All right. Uh, the other argument that's based on ambiguity or a lack of clarity is amphiboly. And this is an argument where it's, there's not ambiguity with regards to a particular word. There's ambiguity with regards to sentence structure, the way the sentence is put together. Uh, and because of this ambiguity, we end up concluding something that is not at all supported by, by the premise. So, uh, for instance, um, Mr. Johnson... Uh, told me about a new oil rig in his office. So Mr. Johnson told me about a new oil rig in his office. His office must be really dirty. Right? Um, okay. Uh, there's ambiguity in the sentence. Mr. Johnson told me about a new oil rig in his office. There's two ways of taking that sentence. One would be uh, the common sense way. I was in his office and Mr. Johnson told me about a new oil rig. The other way to take it is, Mr. Johnson told me about a new oil rig that is in his office. Right? So there's a grammatical uh, ambiguity between uh, those, th that one sentence could mean those two different things. Right? If someone takes the, the premise in the wrong way, they could end up with a faulty conclusion. And that's what happens with the uh, fallacy of amphiboly. Um, another example might be, Stephen discussed dating five different women with his wife. Wow, I didn't know Stephen was a swinger. Right? Um, well, there's two ways of taking that sentence. Right? The way that was taken for this argument was that he discussed the fact that he and his wife together dated five different women. So they had threesomes and such. And that's why the, the person concludes, wow, I didn't know he was a swinger. Right? But there's another possible way of taking that sentence, and it's hopefully the more natural way. Um, Stephen discussed dating five different women with his wife. In other words, he discussed with his wife dating five different women. Maybe they were talking about their past. Like, when I was in college, I dated five different women, honey. Let me tell you about them. There's no reason for you to be jealous. And she's like, oh, that's interesting. That's really nice. That's probably what would be intended if someone said that Stephen discussed dating five different women with his wife. Um, so the one sentence is ambiguous, and someone takes a, a sort of non-standard reading, or certainly not the reading uh, that we would expect, and they make a conclusion from that non-standard reading. Okay, so that's, that is an argument or a fallacy of ambiguity, not as with the case of equivocation, because there's ambiguity with a particular word, but there's an ambiguity in the sentence structure of the premise or the premises. Okay, um, we finish up today with two more fallacies, and these are fallacies of grammatical analogy. Uh, with these fallacies, uh, we, we, make a, we believe that a characteristic uh, that is uh, part of a whole could be attributed to the parts, or a characteristic that's, that's one of the parts could be attributed to the whole, but it's not necessarily the case. So, let's start with the fallacy of composition. In the fallacy of composition, a characteristic of a part is wrongly attributed to the whole. Now, some characteristics of the parts of things can be attributed to, to the whole, and some can't. When a, person does this in, when a person does this in a mistaken way, they commit the fallacy of composition. 
So, for, for instance, you could say all the molecules that make up that person are invisible. Therefore, that person is invisible. Right? So all his molecules are invisible, therefore he is invisible. Now, it may be true that all of the molecules in that person are invisible to the naked eye. It doesn't follow from that that the person is invisible to the naked eye. When you put together all of these molecules that are invisible to the naked eye, there's so many of them that you get a visible, uh, a visible object, the person. Right? So invisibility is not one of those characteristics in this case that can be transferred from, from the uh, parts to the whole. If you do that in an argument, then uh, you are committing the fallacy of composition. Uh, another example would be this. Wow, each player on that team is great. Therefore, the team is great. Uh, recently, we had a, uh, the, a season in which the Los Angeles Lakers barely made the playoffs. And yet, in the offseason, they acquired a number of excellent players. And so you might, you might, at the beginning of the season, say, Wow, the Lakers are a great team. Because look who they've got. You know, they've got Kobe. They've got um, uh, Dwight Howard. Right? They've got all these other people. Wow, that's a great team. Well, as it turns out, someone arguing in that sort of way would have been uh, guilty of the fallacy of composition. Because there's more to being a great team than just having great players. They have to be well coached and they, ha and they have to play well together, not just separately. So if you were to argue that each player on this team is great, therefore the team is great, that can be the fallacy of composition. Just because the parts have that characteristic does not mean that the whole has that characteristic. Now, I want to make a distinction between composition and the hasty generalization. And the way you can tell the difference between composition and the hasty generalization is this. The conclusion of the argument where the composition fallacy is in play is a statement about a class. Whereas the conclusion of the argument uh, of a hasty generalization is a statement about individuals. So with the hasty generalization, I said, we surveyed all these students at Roberts Wesleyan College. 95% uh, of them believed in God, believe in God. Therefore, 95% of Americans believe in God. Right? So individually, every American, uh, if you look at all the Americans, 95% of them are going to believe in God. Right? Whereas with composition, the statement ends up being about the class, right? You're not saying something about, you're, you're saying all the molecules in that person are invisible, therefore the person is invisible. You're saying something about the collective, the person. You're not saying something at that point about the individual molecules in the body, right? Or each player is great, therefore the team is great. That's composition. You're saying something about the composite, about the team. You're not saying something about every member of the team. Whereas with hasty generalization, you say, you know, these two, I went out on, I'm supposed to go out on two dates, I got stood up twice. Guys these days are so inconsiderate. You're saying something about all the guys, every individual guy uh, these days in the world, right? Uh, that, that's a hasty generalization, as opposed to saying something about a composite. And so that's the difference between um, composition and hasty generalization. Now, the second fallacy of grammatical analogy is the fallacy of division. And it's just the opposite of the fallacy of composition. With composition, we have to take a characteristic of the parts and we wrongly attribute them to the whole. With division, we take a characteristic of the whole and wrongly attribute it to all the parts. So, we can just do the opposite of the examples we gave. With division, you might say something like this. Wow, Stephen is visible. Therefore, since he's made up of molecules, all his molecules uh, must be visible as well. Or, wow, that team is great. Each of those players must be great. That's not necessarily the case. You might have role players on that team that help make the team great. The role player's not that good. right? So, with division, we're saying something about the whole and applying it to the parts. And with composition, we take something about the parts and apply it to the whole. In both cases, those attributes should not be uh, attributed in that way, or those characteristics should not be attributed 
in that way.